Wow. What a busy room. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to this session. It's the last session of the day, so we're going to make you work really, really hard. Uh, there's going to be no falling asleep. There's going to be no skiving because we're going to be prowling around to making sure that you are all working together. I've been looking forward to this all day. My name is Sheena. I'm the chair for the session, but you are not here to listen to me. You are here to listen to this wonderful man. I'm going to pass you over straight away to Michael. Thank you very much. I expected six people to show up this afternoon, so you've really impressed me. Uh, I hope your expectations can be fulfilled today for what I'm going to be talking about. So let me walk you through some interesting scenarios and ask a number of questions that the teams at the table will be compiling some answers to, and I'll give you a bit of an agenda of what's coming and a bit of a background to my work. Now, what if games become our work? How many of you have ever seen Ender's Game? Great. So what were the name of the aliens who were invading the Federation that the young pilots had to train for. Does anyone remember? The Formix, okay? The Formix were invading. This had not been their first time. This was the second time. And in fact, Harrison Ford and Ben Kingsley and a number of others played the older senior officers who had been for, through the first invasion. And what they knew was, when these aliens came back the next time, Earth may not be able to repel them. So they set up a huge boot camp to train young children and emergent teenagers to become commanders and pilots of their space vehicles. Because they knew that those individuals were younger, faster, sharper than they were as old farts now who had gone through their first invasion. And they knew if they were going to save Earth, they would have to create a training program that would get the very, very, very best to salvage Earth. In my opinion, we've reached this point where Arthur C. Clarke talked about childhood's end. How many of you were science fiction readers when you were younger? Excellent. I, I read ferociously Heinlein, Clarke, Asanoff, all of the significant authors in this area, and it triggered my imagination significantly. And at childhood end, we have a total transformation taking place on the planet. Now, right now, we're living in an age in which personal narcissism seems to be the overriding concern of many individuals on the planet. And this is not about saving humanity or helping humanity. It is about me, as these individuals would say. It's all about me. And it should be about you. And the people on our planet. We're constantly bombarded now with an incredible amount of conflict instead of collaboration and cooperation. Now, I don't know why. I have a background in theology and philosophy. What I can tell you is there have probably been times on the planet much worse than this, but they didn't have the technology at that time to do what we can do now as in the Korean challenge, the North Korean challenge, and many of us who went through the first Cold War potentially reliving what that was. Because I remember training for that first um, Cold War. I was what was called a radiological monitor. Where I grew up, we were given extra credit if we trained to take a Geiger counter outside of the fallout shelter and check for radioactivity. 
Now, what do we call that? We call that the canary in the coal mine, right? So when I, and of course I was young and naive, and I thought, this is really neat. I love science. Went out. We trained in football fields where they'd put a radioactive isotope. I'm sure it has affected me since. That's why I have no hair. And we were the ones that when weeks would go by, they would push us out and say, go, go check. We would never get back in. I didn't know that at the time. So now we're on the verge of a second Cold War in which we have to worry about these things yet again. And as we've seen from the Hawaii experiment, we're not prepared for this type of nuclear exchange. And we really are at childhood end. Now, languages uh, in this day and age have very little to give us to express holistic experiences. In Ender's Game, in that video, in that movie, the expression of a holistic or a gestalt experience was the upcoming war, and you had to prepare for it. And this is not something that you can teach via text or multimedia. You have to experience it. And so if, at that time, our e-learning in Ender's Game had been PowerPoint slides, occasional multiple choice questions, and uh, a number of background readings, I don't think Enders would have won the game, okay? Because what he went through is a whole, a huge number of personal interactions and experiential learning experiences that prepared him in a way in which he was actually tricked, for those of you who didn't see the movie, to carry out the war as if it was a simulation. And guess what? They won. But he didn't know that, nor his team, until after the war was won. They thought it was just another simulation. And we, there have been individuals in the game-based learning area who have been working for decades to look at serious games and simulations as an emerging new language on the planet, a totally new way of communication not just another instructional design technique, but a brand new vocabulary. And many of us will need to try to learn about that vocabulary to be able to cope with it. So today, I'm going to talk not about game mechanics, not about aesthetics, not about learning outcomes, but I'm going to talk about the idea of an, an emergent communication language. And I'll look at proposing a framework for looking at this and how we can start to move in this direction, because this is something we've never done before. Now, it has been done on the planet before. I will show you a number of these type of games, and some of them quite ancient. But now we have to be playing very serious games and simulations because of the complexity of the problems we're dealing with. A little bit about me. Well, I started out having a fossil collection in a, in a whole bunch of display cases uh, when I was eight. I cataloged them all by period, cross-referenced them on index cards, and was incredibly proud of the work I could do. Won a number of science projects which described atomic orbitals. Uh, these were in high school. And I thought, wow, science, science, mathematics, this will be something I've really, really committed to. And then I discovered games. And that was because I was bullied a lot in school. So on my way to school, I'd get beat up all the time. So the only place I could retreat to was the public library. So I developed an appreciation for the aroma of musty books and a place in the library I could find that was my refuge, away from the real world. And I played lots of games. Often, I couldn't find people to play against me, uh, only because the, they were not as interested in games as I was. And as I grew into my adolescence, 
um, when I was younger, we were called eggheads, not nerds. Nerds is a modern term. But basically, I was the kid with the plastic pen, pen holder, uh, with slide rules, log tables, those kind of things, because I loved the introspective element, the reflective element of those type of tools. And of course, I was one of the first people, because I couldn't find enough people to play chess against, to buy, when I got a little older, saved up all my money from working at A&W uh, and bought a, the, one of the first computer games. And I played Go a lot. How many of you are familiar with Go? Oh, a couple. It's one of the most complex games on the planet. And in fact, in the first uh, opening speech we had yesterday, I think uh, Ro, Ro, Rohin uh, was speaking about IBM now having a game that can replicate this and use artificial intelligence and fuzzy logic to be able to beat its own father or mother. And then, I mean, to me, the neatest thing as a kid was in my physics or chemistry class when the professor said, what is, and he'd write a formula on the board, and I'd reach for my holster, pulled out my slide rule, start pulling it together, checked the log tables, and gave an answer. To me, that was a neat game, because it required skill, it required competency, and it required focus. At the end of my high school, regretfully, my mother passed away. And the physics and chemistry professor at our high school realized I was quite depressed. I had three siblings. I was the oldest. I had to raise them. And so he said to me one day, how about if we build a molecular orbital uh, model and you give a presentation before the American Academy for the Advancement of Sciences by the time you graduate high school. Well, I didn't know what the American Academy was, and I needed something to work with. And I said, yeah, sure, why not? So he taught me how to program in Fortran 2 and Assembler. Then I went down to the local hydro company, begged the IBM maintenance engineer to let me in between 12 midnight and 5 o'clock when he did preventative maintenance. And I programmed a three-dimensional probability contour calculation for the cerium-3 plus ion in trivalent lanthanide series of elements. Now, you say to yourself, what is that? I look at that paper now, and I can't even remember doing it, OK? And I can't even understand how I did it. But somehow I did it. And then I moved into the emerging computer automation area. Over time, purchased early Lisa, early Mac SEs, installed networks, got an Osborne, did all kinds of technology stuff. Why? Because I was a nerd, right? I loved this stuff. I didn't have to worry about people. But then as, as my career grew, what I found was learning had to do with building the relationships between these people. Many of my colleagues were teaching WordPerfect by standing up in front of a group of 25 people, pointing to a screen, saying, OK, if you do file open, everybody do file open, this is what's going to happen. And I thought, that is not the way to teach people. So I built projects. And so as soon as they arrived in the classroom, they did not sit in church pew style. They worked around round or square tables. And the goal was for each of them to work with some team members to be able to figure out how to solve the problem. And the problem became the game. In the last 15 years, um, I was invited back when I got 50 years old by McGill University in Montreal to do a doctorate. Now, for any of you who are even considering doing a doctorate, I can tell you it's the hardest thing you'll ever do. It took me seven years to complete, because I was getting old and slow. 
but the other 22 graduate students who were wor working with me, it was quite cool because they would refer to me as grandpa. And I was only 50, and I thought, I w I'm not a grandpa yet, you know? Now, maybe. And I was not able to get any of the scholarships or fellowships that they did. In Canada, you get almost 40,000 Canadian a year to do a PhD. I got zero, because of two drop-dead questions on the application. One was, what was your GPA in your master's program? Crap, I never did a master's. I was invited in to do a doctorate without a master's. Can anyone guess what the second drop-dead question was? Are you Canadian? Uh, no, <laughs> but that's a good question. <laughs> Most of those grad students with me were not. Now, the second drop-dead question was, we need three letters of reference from your previous professors. All mine were dead, deceased, <laughs> no longer with me. So I actually phoned up the president of the scholarship agency and said, what are you doing? And made an appointment, went in to see her, and she said, we never expected people in your generation to come back to university. Wow, I didn't exactly see myself as leading the parade here. But apparently, becoming a lifelong learner was very rare at that time. Everybody completed their degrees while they were younger. And by the way, I can, remember, I can recommend do that if you can, because going back at 50 is a heck of a challenge. So in all my courses, what I did was to not lecture. I hated lecturing. I'd seen the results of lecturing. Bored students. People, you know, are doing their internet thing or whatever, who really couldn't handle anything but a test. So from the beginning, all of my courses had no tests, no exams. And I'd tell that to the learners at the beginning of the course. And they'd go, oh, yes, all right. I said, you have to demonstrate competencies. What are those? Well, those are going to be skills you need in the workplace. Well, how am I going to develop those? And I said, by playing games. Now, I got two types of responses to that. I had those learners who had come through the traditional grade school and high school and had been lectured at all their life, who said, give me the test. Lecture at me for three hours. That's what I want. And then I had about 85% of the learners who said, games, this is great. I can use this in my workplace. So I've taught undergraduate, MBA, executive MBA, and doctoral learners with games. So, when I was teaching social media management marketing, I had a professor from the other side of the business school come running into my classroom on the last day because all of the learners were playing games that they had actually designed and developed. And he said, could you guys please be quiet? The laughter here <coughs> is drowning out my lectures on the other side of the business school. I said, so how's that going for you? <laughs> and most of them had been to this professor's classes, and they were boring as hell. We had fun. My firm is called Funification. I believe that if you're playing and having fun, you're learning. In fact, we all, well, OK, many of you probably didn't. I'm dating myself. I started out playing in a sandbox. For those of you who remember those, it was a rectangular or square thing where you, you had your trucks and you built castles and, and you learned how to get along with people in the sandbox. You learned teamship. You learned leadership. You learned communication. You learned a whole bunch of things because you were having fun. You didn't even know you were learning it. So why game-based learning? Well, there's a number of deficiencies in our current educational system that game-based learning overcomes. During the Industrial Revolution, the classical approach, traditional, to education may have worked, but I don't think any of us would have wanted to be schooled in the factory like this, OK? And what we saw emerge 
at the turn of the 18th century was called the Prussian model. Now, I know it spread here in Europe. It spread dramatically in the US and Canada. And one of the distinctive elements of the Prussian model, anyone want to pick it out yet? Yes, people sitting in bloody church pews, right? Looking at the front, and guess what they're doing when they have a question? They're raising their hand, okay? Now, that Prussian model was the basis for the Nazi salute and the Italian salute in the Second World War. That was a way of showing respect for the professor at the front and indicating that you had a question. And that professor, from a power position, would communicate to you, it's OK to talk. Otherwise, you got to be silent all the time, right? You were punished if you were a talker or given drugs or diagnosed as AD and HD. And we still have that, that particular Prussian model in place. Now, you've, you notice from these previous photographs, do these really look like engaged learners other than the fake smiles on their face? No, they're not that engaged. Why? Because it's a passive learning model. And in fact, in measuring teacher effectiveness, the whole idea of even standardized tests is thrown out the window. So we got lectures that started in the medieval period. How many of you know a bit of Latin? Lector lectorum. Anyone? Sorry? Great. And the teacher would speak by reading from a book, right? And normally, it was the dark ages, there would be two acolytes on the side with candles so you could see the bloody text, because it was the dark ages. And he read to the students who would be in front of him, in church pews, generally. It was mon monastic. Wow, we have come so far, even with e-learning. Now, instead of being in church pews, we're all behind a video screen looking at the talking head, looking at PowerPoint slides, and then giving some type of response. When students become their own teachers, they learn faster and they have fun. And yet we have forgotten that we can do this. There are a number of authors out now who are talking about this. I have a, a book I'm compiling with another co-author on game-based learning at this stage and how to implement it in LTD, as well as higher education, because often I'm brought into a faculty institute at a traditional university. What's happened? Learner engagement's down. Test scores are terrible. The learners don't pay attention. And the professors have created a professor-centric approach to learning. It's what they are trying to pour into the heads of the students. Now, this is why I don't call my learners students. If you have professor and student, you have a power structure. I come out of the 60s, where we did a lot of demonstrations. <laughs> and when I was hauled away by the RCMP, that's when I think, by the ponytail, I lost much of the hair that was on my head. So what I have found has emerged is a new language. We have a language of mathematics, a language of science, computer science, et cetera. And these languages have their own structure, vernacular, syntax, the punctuation in a way that sometimes creates problems with a holistic experience. So if we want to try to express something such as love, what are we presented with? The difficulty of using symbols to try to express that instead of finding a vocabulary based on a holistic, gestalt-like experience, which games and simulations can create because of their immersing, immersive learning environment that's created. Let's look at 
Music. Music is much more than the sum of its parts. A symphony cannot easily be broken down into the different instruments that play the symphony. The Gestalt experience is listening to the symphony, not to the parts. So with our Tower of Babel type environment now, because of these other languages and because of the complexity of our planet, we're at a point where we should start thinking in terms of serious games and simulations as this new language. Now, I'm not the one that came up with this idea. This is Richard Duke's book. Anybody want to guess when he wrote that book? In the 50s, OK? The concept has been around for a great deal of time. And he worked with a lady called Kathy Greenblatt at Rutgers. And between the two of them, they went all over the world creating games, board games, card games, and playing them with a whole bunch of UN agencies and doing development work in Africa, et cetera, as a way of getting the people involved in learning. Duke's presumption was, as the relative complexity after World War II of our planet increased, gaming has come into place. In fact, it was after World War II, we had eight significant games developed by corporations and universities and used for education, simulations. So that was 1955. And all of the papers written about that highlight the fact they had an incredible impact upon their learners, that they put the learners in a learning space that could not be replicated in a lecture hall. How many of you are familiar with the term VUCA? Great. What does VUCA mean? Volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. Excellent. This is the world we're in right now. It is no longer a simple pre-industrial agricultural world. We are constantly surrounded by complexity. And just like Ender's Game, we have to find a way to bring the younger learners and some of our middle-aged and older learners into a world where they can understand complexity, use decision-making and critical skills, and be able to do what? What are they going to do with those skills? Use them to learn. Pardon? Use them to learn. To learn, but the learning will then result in problems. solving problems. Everything in school, and at least in the business school that I taught in, was about problem solving and critical thinking. Why? Because they got to the workplace, and the first thing they're presented with is all the stuff they didn't learn in school, right? or that we couldn't convey to them in school. So Duke's premise was really this gestalt experience provided a totality experience that people could use to stimulate learning and motivation, but also to solve problems. There. Yes, please. Uh, you've mentioned gestalt a couple of times. What, what way do you mean? Uh, in holistic. Uh, so without a lot of bounds that are constrained by the way our language is linear. And our current languages are very linear. And they're, they're primitive. Let's look at some examples here. You've got the difficulty of trying to describe a macro problem. This is the Integrated Defense Acquisition Technology and Logistics Lifecycle Management System for the US Pentagon. Wrap your head around that. Uh, it took probably 40 to 100 people to even create that, and not a single one could understand the whole thing. And of course, they present it to a Secretary of Defense who's supposed to go, oh yeah, well, we ought to be working down here, you know? There's no way that we brought people through an educational experience to be able to understand that. The piecemeal approach we're taking doesn't allow us to solve hol holistic problems. We, can't, we try to break everything down into very, very small parts and then solve the parts. That doesn't solve the problems. We've seen that with our current 
challenges, let's say, with global warming. Well, does it have anything to do with the plastic in the ocean? Oh, yeah. Does it have anything to do with the agricultural runoff? Oh, yeah. Does it have anything to do with carbon emission? Oh, yeah. But we have no way of approaching that problem now because we were not trained to see a whole. We were only trained to see parts of a whole. So instead of listening to a symphony, all we're doing is hearing the trumpet or the guitar. So at your tables now, you got three minutes. So that means you don't have time for everyone to talk. At the same time, I want you to try to identify what you would see as a communicative competence for people in terms of games and sims. All of you have played games. So what's one of the elements of games? Rules, mechanics, the competition or cooperation. Fun, excellent, who said fun? Precisely, you're supposed to learn by having fun, by playing. What are the participants called? Players, they play. So what I want you to do, come up with a, some ideas on defining communicative competence to be able to approach large problems, starting now. And then we'll have each table report out, or at least two or three tables report out. Communicative competence means using a lang of language of communication, OK? All of us communicate, right? We write, we read, we talk. So we've got all got the experience to talk about communicative competence. And talk about this in terms of sims and gaming. All of you have played simulations or games. I can only count to three, so I'm uh, one. Now, that was not bloody easy, was it? It wasn't supposed to be. If it was easy, you could go to the next room, OK? <laughs> and this is why, when we start to think of game-based learning as a new language of communication, we have a, such a hard time. How would we describe the language of, let's take English. How do you start to describe the language of English? Give me two characteristics of the language of English. I used to be an English teacher. So. Good, <laughs> good. <laughs> it's a sentence stressed language. So you okay. speed up and slow down depending on the amount of words in the sentence. Uh, it's a, it's not a phonetic, doesn't have a phonetic alphabet. Good. So the words, words are written differently. You said two, do I have to do any more? As everyone knows from knife, right? <laughs> There's grammar. Yeah. There's punctuation, mm -hmm. sentence structure, paragraph structure. There's different ways to verbally communicate versus written communication. So you see, we all do it, but we forgot why and how we got to the point that we can do it. And that's why game-based learning is such a challenge to introduce into a corporate environment. As I was saying to a table at the back, I said, uh, so you're going to the executive of the organization, and you're saying, look, we want to play at work. Oh, yeah, that goes over really fast, really well, OK? And we want to bring in facilitators trained to help us to learn how to have fun when we're playing. Have you ever had a group of people you played a game with, and they were all boring as hell? You know, that's what bad game-based learning is about, right? Oh, let's get out the Monopoly board again. Oh, yeah, we had fun last time, right? Highly competitive game. And if you lose too many times, do you want to play Monopoly again? No, never. So some communicative competencies. Let me pick out some people. Uh, the gentleman right in front of you right now. Great. Talk to me about some of the competencies you discovered with your group. I think we talked a lot about the ecosystem, being sort of aware of the overall sort of system as well as the tasks that need to happen Good. within it. So you know, I'm just going to punctuate each one. That's part of our language now. 
So an ecosystem, a context, there's got to be a problem you're solving, like in Ender's Game. There was going to be another invasion. The whole human race was going to disappear, just like in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, right? And they had to find a way to train people, to educate them, to solve the problem. Another competency. I'd say that norms, so such as trust and rules, things that establish the sort of parameters of the ecosystem. Great. So there are certain characteristics around relationship building. Do you want to play with people who cheat? Not many of us do. And in the old Wild West in the US and Canada, that was often solved, the card games were often solved over a gun, OK? Because cheating was relatively rampant. Everybody wanted that wee bit of gold. Another one. Some of the sort of technical or task-driven challenges, the tasks you're actually trying to accomplish. Good. So there's structure to the odyssey, to the quest that's going on. You just can't. It, it, most of us read classics when we were younger, at least I hope we did. So you had Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. These were not harebrained ideas of an indiv a Greek individual going from island to island. It was a progression. There was a hero. There was an interaction with different gods that uh, Homer described in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Characters. So another competency is how do you convey roles, as you've mentioned, and the characteristics of those roles? World of Warcraft. How many of you have ever played it? Good, good. Uh, you, you, what, what happens when you play? You go in there, and you get the stuff knocked right out of you, don't you? And you get down, you fail, and you go back in again with a different sword or a shield this time. And then you get the shit kicked out of you again. And then you do it again and again until you build up the interaction competency. What's going on between the players and what the goal is? What's the goal of World of Warcraft? What we better than, than the opponent. Excellent. But you always, you always chase the numbers. Your weapon has a, or your shield has a, a value. So you always try to get a better weapon, so, and there is no end to it. There's always, there's no, you reach the end of the game. There's always more and more and more. Excellent. And it's, it's called the like grind, so you always, you are doing grinding, basically. <laughs> Time based. All right, uh, where was another group that I saw from a competency point of view yeah. that got it? The gentleman in the pink shirt back there? So how do you communicate some of these competencies? Graham, isn't it? Graham? We came up with the structure you've already mentioned with rules and engagement, but then it was we were discussing it. And then in discussing, I hadn't realized mentioning things like trust. Uh, a little louder? Sorry, mentioning trust. Trust. Uh, and uh, being, able, being able to use the game as an area to fail safe, do something that was not the norm play with that, find out what happened as a result. If you went down a particular route, you weren't going to crash the company, you weren't going to spend fortune. It's a very it. inexpensive way of not putting the company in the toilet if you simulate a business, right? Yeah. I mean, when someone says, it's so expensive to develop these, oh, OK, why don't I just put the company in bankruptcy when I'm experimenting? No, that's not feasible. Oh, OK. Well, let's invest in a business simulation that gives me the chance to fail and learn. Excellent. So when we look at the conversion of the Latin script for writing, listening, reading, and speaking, we have a very linear, constrained approach to convey information and knowledge. And in fact, it used to be a lot of knowledge was conveyed by books, right? still are, and is that a really efficient way to convey information? It's not bad, but it's not the most optimal, because when you're done reading the book, if you have studied it and learned from it, you have a gestalt experience. All at once, it comes rushing to you. In the Cameroons, Bamun King Noya 
decided he would invent, with the help of his people, a new way of describing their experiences in Cameroon. What a nice change over our Latin script, because each one of these icons has significant meaning associated with them. And of course, they would have to be put together in some fashion to be communicated. Many of you are quite young. How many of you know of Marshall McLuhan? Does that ring a bell at all? Oh, wow. Wow. Three, maybe? Marshall McLuhan? Oh, I'm going to have a heart attack here. Marshall McLuhan was a great Canadian. I'm Canadian, so you can see why I'm putting the plug in. Who transformed communication theory by talking about the media is the message. OK? Well, I would have to propose that at this stage, serious games, sims, gamification is that language now. So the medium is the message was an old way of looking at it. So television was a way of conveying information in a script. Early television was all scripted, including the news. Oh, that doesn't happen now, does it? Not in the <coughs> series we have or, or Fox News. It's never scripted. It's always spontaneous. Now, in order to look at this concept of a language, we now have to start looking at a new way of perceiving sims and games. So for those of you from Britain, you know what the F word means. He's one of my favorite chefs. So at this stage, we're going to start talking about the F words. If you can't handle it, definitely leave, OK? And we're going to talk about them in a framework of the platonic solids. Now, oh, I'm sorry I offended you. <laughs> Does, did anyone study a little bit of mathematics, philosophy, theology, and run across something called the, that Plato developed called the platonic solids? Work with me here. Somebody? Oh, oh, quick, somebody with a mic. Get back to the lady in red there. <laughs> now, it's interesting. How did this young lady get recognized? She tentatively put up her hand. I want to propose that one of the new ways, instead of the Prussian model, that we start to recognize people in a conversation and dialogue is through a different type of symbol. And this is the symbol I propose. OK? Why? Because I'm thinking about it, OK? I have something I want to share that I'm thinking about. And it's outward going, not inward going, OK? So in my MBA classes, my undergrad class, classes, my doctoral classes, it's the first thing I do is to train them out of this into this. And guess what happens when you do this? You make a complete commitment with your body. You're encircling your head, your mind, and you're basically saying, I have something to share. It's a different way of communicating. But it's much more friendly, shall we say, than the Prussian model. So tell me a little bit about the platonic solids. You thought I forgot the whole thing with my little story, right? <laughs> I was wondering what was going to come to me. Um, they are shapes that are um, beautiful in the sense that they are built from simple forms. So you can see it's built from a triangle, built uh, as a set of triangles fitting together. A cube is squares. And, and these are the kind of core shapes, I suppose. Excellent. So these are geometric shapes that Plato considered to be pure geometric shapes. And the reason he considered them to be pure was that each one of them consisted of three faces intersecting at a point. Three faces intersecting at a point. So even over here, take a look. Three faces. Three faces, three faces, three faces. So there was a purity in the mathematics behind this. So I'm proposing this is a framework we start to look at the F words with. 
Okay? So, if we deal with the tetrahedron, which, by the way, was about fire, we have fun, flow, form, and fiaro. We, each of those is a face of the tetrahedron. And it's a way of showing the relationships, the purity of the relationships, between very critical elements of game-based learning. Now, Fiaro. Oh, let's go back here for a second. Anyone, what is Fiaro? Who's Italian in here? Come on. All right, what's Fiaro? Pride. Pride, yes. So what happens when you're at the soccer game or the football game? Yes! You're proud of the winning team, right? There's energy there. And which, by the way, works very well into my new form of being recognized, right? And Fiaro was brought to the attention of game-based learning by Jane McGonigal, who is one of the, let's say, leading thought leaders in this area. It's this feeling of accomplishment, of pride. And that's what a simulation or a game has got to bring to the player. The player has to walk away feeling very proud of that experience. Another element, flow. Who can pronounce this gentleman's last name? Great, and what is it? Excellent. A Hungarian who came to the US, couldn't speak English, decided to go to the University of Chicago, got his bachelor's, learned English while he got his bachelor's, and then they gave him a job. Hey, why don't you get in the doctoral program? He did that, and he's come up with a psychological theory of flow. That game experience, that simulation has to have flow. Flow is a very particular way of balancing boredom with anxiety. And you've got to make sure that as you're doing that, you're increasing skills and competencies, and you're increasing the challenge, which is why World of Warcraft has multiple levels, different ways of playing it. Most of the games we play have multiple levels in them, because otherwise you're going to become bored with it. The hexahedron, some more F words. Feelings, features, figurative, failure, feedback, functional. So we can approach now each of these platonic solids with a number of F words. Words that describe elements of the, and competencies of the game environments that we need to create. So we've got fair play, fascination, fertility, fellowship, futuristic, frameable, blah, blah, blah. And yes, I did go through the dictionary looking up a whole bunch of these that were relevant. So why an analogy? Why do we want to use an analogy here? Uh, the lady in Burgundy. Why do we need an analogy? We're talking about game-based learning. Doesn't everybody get it? Great. Go ahead, say it. Commit. It's easier to, uh, to, to understand. How Great. And to remember. And to remember, yeah. Good. Thank you. That wasn't that difficult, was yeah. it? <laughs> so we, when I began this conversation with you, I began by saying we needed a new language to communicate game-based learning. This is the emergence of that kind of language. Now, this work was not done by Richard Duke or Kathy Greenblatt in the 50s and 60s, okay? This is new work that we're undertaking now because there are so many games, serious games and sims being developed, that we have an underlying mechanic, mechanistic structure to them, but that's, that's like the bridges and the roads. It's infrastructure. We need a conceptual model that makes it easier for us to make sure that our game experiences are immersive and evoke motivation, engagement, and commitment to the, by the learners. So what is a game? Let me pick someone I haven't picked yet. Uh, the young lady in blue with red hair. Oh, no, it's me! 
<laughs> oh, come on. What's a game? Give me, just give me an off the cuff. This is not a test. Fun. Fun. Okay, it's something fun. Good. A challenge. Great. Others? Competition. Sometimes it's competition. Sometimes it's uh, an experience. A social interaction. Good. So what we have are a number of ways to start to define what that underlying infrastructure is in a game-based experience. And uh, th this is a definition by Boiler and Cap, and it's become one of the accepted definitions of the infrastructure of the game. But that's only one part of it, OK? So what's a simulation? Andrew, what is a simulation? I should know this, but it's um, it's like a, a demo, like living an activity, like trying an activity. That's a good start. Anybody want to continue with it? Ah, please. Hey, see, he's caught on it. Well done, sir. It's a representation of reality. Exactly. That's the key thing I was looking for, a representation of reality. It is not reality, and yet all of us have as we know, both in philosophy and psychology, different views of reality. That's why when eight people witness an accident, you have eight different stories. What are the facts? That's hard to ascertain. So we have to find a way to cre create a new reality. And simulations have experimentation, prediction, evaluation, and learning associated with them. So if you have a simple mathematical s simulation of a formula, that's not what I'm talking about, OK? Because it may not convey learning. So other examples. These are ancient games used throughout Africa to teach individuals who are generally illiterate all kinds of interaction skills, mathematics, uh, skills on counting, because those games were all about their crops, their herds, and how they moved. And so they were competitive, but they promoted self-confidence in the individuals who played them. And they learned a whole bunch of values associated with social interaction from them. So we might consider them primitive games, quite to the contrary, highly complex games of both social interaction and simulation of reality. So Duke talked about the need for this quantum leap, then, that we've got to take. We've got to get away from these constraints and limitations and start looking at finding a way for a holistic experience to be conveyed to people. That means we've got to design it, and people have to experience it. Two different sides to that equation. Because of the complexity going on, this new language has to come into place soon. And that's because our complex problems are just multiplying. We had Prince Charles, I saw in the newspaper yesterday, talk about the fact that at last people are waking up that plastic is in the ocean. It only took us 30 years. Now he says it'll be another 20 years before anyone takes action. Wow. That's going to be a little bit late since it's already in the food chain. So we've got significant problems that we've got to use games and simulation to try and solve. Because we aren't solving it the way we're working with it now, piecemeal. And it's only going to get more complex. So in World of Warcraft, I don't know if any of you are aware, but over 50 billion hours by players have been used in World of Warcraft. That's equivalent to six million years. Now, what if we had put that into simulating a launch to Mars or Jupiter and made the challenge that we would invent new technology, new software to cope with new problems that would emerge while we're going to Mars, instead of taking all of this time to learn how to use a sword and a shield in World of Warcraft. We could be doing much more for the planet. 
We're in the midst of a perfect storm. And by the way, we're losing the battle. So there are a number of great examples of this type of communication language. Uh, Gin, uh, Mintzberg at McGill University came up with coaching ourselves. He decided an MBA program is too expensive. By the way, he taught in an MBA program, just like I have. But he said, we got to have ways that people on the shop floor can learn these skills quickly. So he invented the simulated reality in which people sit around a table and they coach themselves on problems that they dialogue about based on going through each of these suite of pages. They're generally about 12 to 14 pages long. I've used them in my MBA class. In fact, he invited me to come to the conference that he gives every year because he said it could never be used in an MBA class. Well, you can tell that when someone says that to me, it's not going to stop me. So three of my learners and I authored a paper on how we put it into practice in an MBA program. And it created exceptional learning and self-reflection for the individuals involved. Fligby. Anyone play Fligby yet? This is a leadership development game based on 21 different leadership competencies. It is not the kind of simulation you play for an hour and a half. It takes 6 to 12 hours to play. So people have to live and get into the immersive experience. And the results are, and it's now been played by over 40,000 learners, either corporate or university. And in the outcomes, most of the individuals who have gone through this have said, this gave me the capability to fail and learn, and learn quickly. In fact, there's redo capabilities if you get too deep into the bad part. And it's also based on flow. Shikson Maheli was one of the consultants that helped to build Fligby. So you're awarded points if you create flow in the organization. What a unique approach. So it's not just profit, but flow. Fresh biz game. Anyone ever play this? It's for entrepreneurs. I take it into my entrepreneurship classes, changes the way they think. After playing it once, they think differently. After playing it twice, because by the way, the rules that I don't give them the first time mean that they start off on this, and they play it like Monopoly. Who got, got to the winner's circle first? I did, I did, it's all competitive, right? So I tell them, oh, by the way, that wasn't the rule. The rule is you've got to bring everybody to the winner's circle. You've got to build strategic alliances. So the second time they play, it usually takes them three hours, normally an hour, because most of it is negotiation and dialogue with the people they're playing with. They learn about relationship building. Um, here's another one, excellent one, called Planet Jockey. You're an emerging CEO of a company, cartoon-based. It's been played. Uh, Google introduced this to its engineers in California to play because engineers generally make terrible managers. Generally. There's a few exceptions. And guess what? After 3,000 of them played this, they started to go to meetings. They started to see things differently. They started to build new competencies. And it's cartoon-based. Wow. Well, that's, you know, it kind of disarms people when it's cartoon-based, right? They don't realize by the time they're done that they've played that. Here's one, uh, World Without Oil. Anyone familiar with this game? 2,000 players played this. McGonagall put it online. People volunteered, they played it. It's how to cope when your part of the world runs out of oil. And the amount of Interaction and dialogue was second to none. People became addicted to it, to try to figure these things out. Anyone here of the College of Extraordinary Experiences? It's in Poland. Once a year, they get together, look at all the blokes there. And they do role-playing. That's what LARPs are, role-playing. 
for three days. It's like a Game of Thrones on steroids by people who all dress up to try to win the gold. It is. <laughs> and so the, the focus of games is not necessarily the focus on the game itself. It's on being able to find a way to assess when people are learning from it. For example, with some organizations now, just to get an interview, you have to play a game. I don't know if you're familiar, MI5 here has now announced, if you want to be a spy, okay, first thing you do is you've got to play a game. And they determine from that game how good you are at certain observational skills and a no large number of other competencies. I'm wrapping this up, okay? So for those of you who are saying he's going a bit over time, I am. Sorry about that, but I really got involved with the dialogue we had. And so McGonagall is talking about the fact that if we institute this new language of simulations and games, we have a tool to overcome the complexity and problems that we're faced with. Without that, we will continue to do the same thing over and over again and approach the problems, the immense problems that we're presented with piecemeal. So this gives us a way of creating a holistic experience that is much bigger, that eureka moment, that fiaro moment, much bigger than if we read about it. Another person, Mark Prensky, anyone familiar with Mark? I think he was the one who came up with the idea of digital natives and did a lot of research on video games before they became serious games. And he says, uh, math, English, social studies, it's a mess. Throw those away. We're, not, we're, we're turning out people that are functionally illiterate by having them study those things in a lecture hall. So the overriding goal we have is to create better workplaces where the learning spaces are the game, where people can have fun but be productive and perform. And that's the way you sell it in business. This is a performance enhancement tool. This is a form of steroid that will get you better return on your personnel. Buckminster Fuller was a visionary who had a real interesting way of approaching the problems of architecture. When he was told you could not build a geodesic dome, he said, to hell with you. I will build a geodesic dome. And in Expo 67 or something in Montreal, the geodesic dome went up. From his point of view, don't worry about what other people are thinking. Build a new model. And that's what we're talking about with the platonic solids. A new way of creating a framework with a lot of the F words. See, that gets people's interest right, right away, right? With a lot of F words on how we're going to incorporate communication competencies into games. So I'd ask a, a leading question at this stage. Would anyone like to hazard a guess? Now remember, this is a guess. No one's being graded on this. What could be the next steps in creating this kind of communication language? <coughs> Take a risk. You can afford to fail here. Nobody's going to talk about it. Please. Um, it's not really oh, just a second. We'll get your voice in here. Uh, it's not really an answer to the question. It was more a, re a reflection. Um, in the previous activity with our group, we talked about Pictionary as an example of communication uh, skills. Excellent. And I was thinking about um, what was your view on cultural differences in terms of language? Uh, because there are some languages, aside from English, and I'm thinking especially of uh, Asian and all languages based on pictures, in which you don't have the single word, you have the whole concept. Correct. And that encourages an entire new and different way of thinking. And in, in one of my classes, for example, we did this test, and we had uh, three pictures, uh, a monkey, a panda, and a banana. 
and we were asked, okay, what is their correlation? And most Westerners would say the monkey and the panda because they're both animals. But the people from Asia would say the monkey and the banana because the monkey eats the banana. So I don't know if you had an experience of introducing this new language within the concept, this concept. Yes, I have. Most of my MBA courses uh, would be at least a third Asian, uh, a third European or South American, and a third North American. And they all got it. So when we developed or developed games or took off the shelf games using Lego or Connects, they got it. What they ended up is walking away from the experience realizing they had used a particular tool to facilitate facilitate learning about leadership, learning about teamship, about communication, bigger concepts, gestalt holistic concepts. And my biggest challenge after that was I would get emails from my learners all the time saying, where can I buy the Legos? Because they wanted to do this at work with their teams because they saw it work. So there is a challenge, there is no doubt, but once you get past the rules of engagement associated with this simulation or game, they get it. In fact, Fligby has been played in all countries all over the world, from Chile to South Africa to Hungary. Thank you for taking the time at the end of today to learn a little bit about game-based learning as a new communications language. I hope I've been able to fulfill your expectations. I'm here to entertain any questions you might have, but I don't want to hold anyone back at this stage. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>